Well, yes, friends, today we celebrate this solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, heralded by many as the most challenging topic and mystery and reality to preach on. You know, the awesome mystery of God, most holy, to speak about this. I mean, don't all words fall short in describing God? Yeah, in a way they do. But at the same time, when we turn and face that glorious mystery of the Blessed Trinity, what we find is just a, a wellspring of life-giving and life-affirming meaning, a depth of meaning that's supposed to ground us as Christians and to move us as missionaries, prayerfully growing closer to and serving God, and then to serve others, you know, to glorify God with our service towards others, our God of relationship, our God who loves us. You know, we know as Christians, we're not called to hoard God and his grace for ourselves. No, we're, all, we're called to receive and then to offer it. Friends, in our first reading, we have this beautiful passage from the book of Proverbs about wisdom, wisdom personified. And to lead into this blessed attribute and gift of the Holy Spirit, and person, the enfleshed wisdom, the incarnate word of God. To lead into this, I have a joke, you know, a joke about wisdom. And perhaps you heard it, but here it goes anyway. A long, long time ago, not in a galaxy far, far away, but here, here on earth, down in Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon, to be exact, beautiful abbey, it's actually the mother abbey of our own Westminster Abbey here in Mission. Anyway, many, many moons ago down in this Benedictine monastery, Mount Angel Abbey, there was a monk, and he was the abbot. He was the boss. Father Luke was his religious name, but since he was abbot, all the monks and all the visitors to the abbey would call him Father Abbot, Father Abbot Luke. At the time, he was... 98 years old, wise old priest, joyful, playful, discerning, such a, a paternal pillar of strength to so many. Well, here at 98, he's on his deathbed, and the monks would be checking in on him, uh, checking in, on him in the infirmary around the clock, trying their best to make the tail end of his pilgrim journey on earth as comfortable as possible. And even up until the end, Father Abbott, he had a pretty good appetite. And one day, they tried to, to give Father Abbott some warm milk that he, he normally enjoyed, but at this time, he just seemed to refuse it. Then, on a whim, one of the junior monks took this glass of warm milk down back to the kitchen, and remembering that the Abbey was given a little gift by one of their benefactors, for Christmas. And he thinks back, yeah, three months ago we got this gift and we haven't opened it. And the gift was a bottle of Irish whiskey. And so, and so this junior monk, so I'm going to open this up. And he pours a little bit into the fair amount, actually, into the warm milk. Then back at Father Abbot Luke's bedside, another monk gives it to Father Abbot to see if he would just take a little bit. And as soon as, as soon as the milk touched his lips, Father Abbott's eyes opened a little, and his right hand came up to clutch on to the glass. And Father Abbott, he, he drank a little bit, and then he drank a little bit more. And then before you knew it, Father Abbott drank the whole beverage down to the very last drop. And by this time, Father Abbott really perked up. He was... He was quite awake and even open to conversation. And another junior monk, he saw this. And so with a notepad, the junior monk comes over and requested that Father Abbott offer in his last days here a nugget of wisdom, some, some wisdom from this sage of a man. And so the junior monk politely asked, Dear Father Abbott, if you're up to it, you know, please give us some wisdom before you pass away. And Father Abbott, he smiled at the junior monk, and then his smile turned into a stare, stared at him. And then he stared down at his empty glass of milk. 
Then his eyes gazed over to his left through the window. Nice day, 200 yards away, there's a cluster of Holstein cows, milk-producing cows, grazing on the pasture. Then his eyes gazed back to the glass, the empty glass of milk. Then his eyes gazed forward, back to the junior monk. And he said, my son, do not sell that cow. <laughs> wisdom. You know, a little wisdom there. A little wisdom. Not a sacred cow, but a special cow, you know. So, yes, maybe a twisted wisdom. It, it is a joke. It is a joke. But in all seriousness, we look at that wisdom. You know, wisdom to be wise. You know, it's one thing to be smart, to be an intellectual, to have a, a vast knowledge about a number of subjects. But it's another thing to be wise. And someone once said that intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. And so, okay, you have this glimpsing here of a natural wisdom, you know, applying experience and knowledge and good judgment to combine them all at once. And this sort of wisdom is certainly noteworthy. But, but when we talk about divine wisdom, the wisdom of God, and the gift of the Holy Spirit called wisdom, this is categorically different. This is miles above any natural wisdom. And like the mystery of God itself, that divine wisdom, it all comes back down to relationship. In the book of Proverbs, in our first reading today, this is what we hear, quote, Thus says the wisdom of God, when he established the heavens, I was there, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the water might not transgress his command when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of Adam, says the wisdom of God. And who is the wisdom or the word of God? Well, we find out exactly who this is in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. It's Jesus, the incarnate Word of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, God enfleshed. And here in this strikingly poetic passage from the book of Proverbs, we are led to something, and it's something more beautiful than God's creative power, and more impressive than God's artistry and masterful right ordering of the material universe with its absolutely sublime mathematical precision. More than this, friends, more than this, is God's delight, his delight, his love, his tender and powerful and personal love for you, for me. What we read in the book of Proverbs is this, this wisdom, capital W, wisdom, this son of the father. The father looks upon the son with delight. And this is a shared delight. And then the son looks upon the children of Adam, all humankind. He looks upon them with delight. And can you picture this, dear friends? Can you picture yourself? And let's say, let's say one of our worst moments, one of our, one of mine, one of your most regrettable moments. We all had them. Picture yourself entrenched in some kind of sin, whatever the sin may be. And of course, God doesn't approve of any sin, any kind of sin. God does, does desire us. He desires us, obviously, for, to strive for something better, to strive for the fullness of life in accordance with the moral law. Okay, at the same time, let's picture ourselves in a dark place which we willingly walked into, and we feel the heaviness of it all. We feel the regret. We feel that sensation in our hearts that we're made for more. Now, even in the depth of that darkness, get this, dear friends, even in the depth of that ugliness, God delighted in you as a child. God delights in you. 
And some, for some people, this is really hard to believe, but it's true. The fact that we're, we're sinners in need of a Savior does not water down the most foundational truth, that we are beloved, that we are beloved daughters and sons of the Father, and that the Father delights in you, and that the Son delights in you. God loves you. And just to soak this in, in a fresh way here, right here today, on the solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, we get to soak this in. And friends, when we have that refreshed sense of God's love for us, and when we have a reinvigorated sense of our own ability to re respond boldly in faith, to love God back, and to love to extend that charity to other fellow children of God, that right there, that's the most pure form of wisdom. Everything else, every other authentic step toward healthy living follows from that. The great St. Augustine, way back at the turn of the fifth century, he wrote this very personal prayer, a prayer that highlights who God is, why God matters, and what this means for us. Exercising his gift of wisdom, St. Augustine, he says this, he prays, O oh God, to know you is life, to serve you is freedom, to praise you is the soul's joy and delight. Guard me with the power of your grace here and in all places, now and at all times, forever. Amen. And I love this. I love this. From St. Augustine, there's this just a wise expression of the heart that's just been lifting up heavenward. St. Augustine speaking of the truth about God, encountering God, cultivating his relationship with God through his words and actions, this ushering in of life and meaning. And there's this petition at the end, quote, guard me with the power of your grace, here and in all places, now and at all times, forever. Amen. And here we, we just get a glimpse into St. Augustine's childlike heart, you know, dependent on God, who loves him. He knows God loves him. Such pure wisdom. And that love, dear friends, that love is for us today, brothers and sisters. All we have to do is faithfully receive and then to respond boldly, receiving that love of God and then faithfully sharing it. And we pray, most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us.